is up, Shark Nation. Welcome to another episode of the Shark Pod, uh, live from Greystone Studios. Um, this episode may or may not be brought to you by Skillshare. Um, they haven't got back to me about that Irish bank account yet, so uh, this is, we're gonna maybe put the put some details in the show notes. But that's a, a great company that we'll be rec- we may or may not be recommending to our audience pretty soon, maybe next week. Um, we've got Mark Baker out in Glenageary. How are you doing, Mark? Brilliant. How are you, Luke? All good. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, we've got a great guest. Something that me and, me and Mark have been talking about for years: how to get how to get organised uh, uh, in the industry of uh, of waste management. Um, and we've got John O'Connor of Collectory on the line. How are you doing, John? Hey, how are things? Thanks for having me on. Delighted, delighted to have you here. Like we were saying just before the podcast, me and Mark were always saying, like the you know, especially when you became an adult and you have to start dealing with waste yourself. You know, there's that kind of transition where you like you have to set up all the billing, all that type of stuff. And the uh, for a lot of the time, my uh, the the service end of things or the setup has not been great, John. I, like generally uh, in the industry growing up, um, you know, some bins not being collected or uh, it just it always seems like a bit of a hassle. And it looks like they, they were just disorganized and stuff like that. So um, with Collect.ie, I guess you guys are putting a little bit of technology behind that. Or... Yeah. Sorry, no. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Somebody. You're, you kind of went on a star, Lou. Sorry. Did I? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, John, uh, how would you kind of uh, how would you kind of frame uh, the the business uh, collect, and um, like, what do you guys do? How do you serve your customers? Yeah, so it's like funny you should uh, mention uh, your experience when you're younger. You know, I think everyone has that when they move out into their own. I remember getting a house when I was going to college, and you know, you get a bin company, and uh, you just don't even think you don't even think of that as a utility. And I just just when you brought mentioned that, like I didn't think of this at the time but uh there was no brands like uh, at least 10 15 years ago there was no brand that immediately spring to mind and there probably still is no national brands that when you think like you know when you think of food you think just these when you think of waste there isn't probably anyone that springs to mind so um yeah i was shocked that i had to pay for my own waste <laughs> when i went to college and um yeah i suppose like it, it maybe maybe in my mind it was like one of those things that i i thought of in the future um that i I might go into this as a business but anyways like everything it's just like for me getting into the waste industry was just a journey like and it was uh you know what was going on in my life at that time and um the uh i had a, I had a business that i was on petrol four courts and i got involved in doing these uh big bins they're bins where you drop off rubbish so I, um, you know, it was a pay-as-you-go uh, waste disposal unit. So people used to drive to their local forecourt and put bags of rubbish into the bin and they pay seven euros for two bags. And, um, you know, that business is really successful from the get-go. Um, and when I was in that business, you know, Uber was going on and all these technology companies, Airbnb, and it was probably the exact same thing you were thinking. I had this waste business over here that was a waste drop-off. And then I was thinking, there's all this... Co- cool tech over here that puts everything on demand and they're building really good brands and they're very good with customers and uh you know i was like okay what can we do here and i would have uh you know started collecting my two found my two co-founders uh john hegarty and robbie scoose and we would have uh said how can we make it simple for people to book away service online and that's that's really where we just came from and you know we've been going five years now sort of perfecting that and only five years. So I was looking at the website and, uh, you know, you guys have uh, gone public in Stockholm, which I think we'd love to dig into just as a just as an interesting thing of because, again, you're t- taking the, the waste management or the, the kind of there's a lot of people out there in Ireland that are uh, have, have kind of small businesses, kind of a man of the van businesses as well doing uh haulage or waste collections independently and stuff like that. But uh, go go and do a you know, uh, looking for investors and stuff like that really is the next level. So it'd be interesting to dig into that as well. But when you, when you were, uh, starting out, was this like an industry that you got into originally or what was your, your first, when you left college that time after you, uh, got over paying for bins and stuff like that, what was the, the next move? Yeah. So like I would have been in business, um, like I'm, I'm, there's one thing I know I am as an entrepreneur, you know, and I'm really uncertain about other things <laughs> like as in, as in what I, I was, the only thing I was sure I could do was do business goods. And like, um, I was, I wouldn't have been confident in other areas growing up or anything like that. Wouldn't have been good at sport. Um, but I was really good at like, uh, not spotting an opportunity, but like, you know, I, I've seen this before when I was, um, I was into music when I was young. So I became a manager of a band 
Um, you know, then I went to college and I loved going out to nightclubs. So I managed nightclubs. Then I went to the gym and the gym wasn't that good. So I opened up gyms. Do you know, all my businesses were like a solution to a problem or me thinking I could do something better. Um, so like that's that's really like how the biz, all my like, you know, my entrepreneurial, like it's just in me to spot an opportunity. And so the bins was um, getting into the waste industry was I would have been in, uh, as I said, I was in on uh, businesses on petrol forecourts and I had uh, restaurants and, you know, I would have been familiar with rubbish, but uh, I came across um, this concept over in Europe where people drive to a destination like a civic community site and they pay to get rid of their rubbish. And I just thought, wouldn't it be really cool if you could put these on Tesco and Topaz forecourts and people, when they miss their bins or they have extra rubbish or they um, you know, don't want to pay bin charges, they could just drive up to their local pet- petrol station and pay to get rid of rubbish. So um, that's like how we got into the waste. Like I said earlier, that's how we got into the waste industry was like just seeing that concept in Europe. Then there was a company in Wexford that had a few compactors and just sort of putting technology into the compactors and you know, creating a little mini civic amenity sites on petrol forecourts. It's, um, it's amazing as well. Like, I was just thinking that generally, like, if you miss a bin, especially I've got a, a new baby now, and the amount of like waste stuff that we're producing, you know, if we miss a bin, <laughs> it's, a, it's a big deal. <laughs> I mean, like, we're gonna like, uh, we're we're gonna have a mess in our hands here. So it'd be cool to be able to just get rid of like stuff kind of ad hoc. And when you started to do that, was that uh, uh, a relatively low? Uh, capital uh, it was a more kind of like hustle going into these four courts going and say you know uh, making kind of ad hoc deals with these guys uh, who own the the four courts that you're going into or was it kind of get into brands how do you how do you, how do, you do that business yeah so like you, what, you, what you're doing is you're looking for a petrol four court and like some of them are really big and they you're looking for two car parking spaces so you're looking for each bin takes up one full car parking space so it's really about how big the four court space is and how much revenue you can give them for those two spaces so I'd always pitch it to the people as like I will you can make 10,000 euros commission for those two spaces is that worth it and I'll also will advertise through digital and local media that this bin is on in this town in this location so everyone will have to come to your shop to uh, get rid of the rubbish um, so look some people went for it um, I did um, I did deals with Tesco's Topaz and Apple Green um, and we we rolled out with you know we rolled out with different sites that were that were suitable with them, and we also did independent uh, four four court operators. Um, so like it was they're pretty capital intensive. Like you'd be talking about it's a fifty thousand euro investments per site. Okay. You know by the time you put two compactors on, like they're they've got technology in them that tell you when they're full or you know when they need to be collected because when they're what happens is like a person drives up with their bags of rubbish, like you do. You, you gave that example of someone forgetting to put out their bins. That usually means you're in trouble in my in my experience, because like when I forget to do that, like it's like, you know, it's like, oh, my God, you forgot to put the bins out and I'm stuck. We're stuck with all this rubbish now. And so people loved that they could go up to their local petrol station and get rid of their extra bags or after they had a party. So um, but the bins themselves were like there was lots they had to do to meet regulation. We had to. They had to, uh, you had to sign up online beforehand. You had to look after the weights. You had to be able to tell how much went into the bins. You had to be able to tell when there was like 600 bags there at capacity. So you needed some, um, you needed to know when they're nearly at capacity. So you could send the trucks around to collect them. And, you know, then they'd tie in with the till systems. So there was a good bit of tech in them. Um, so you're, it's a, it was a, it was a, it's a very um, capital uh, hungry business to scale us. Really? Okay. And then from that, so are you guys with the the collect business is, does that have an element of that still is that still part of the portfolio of stuff that you guys do or yes yeah, so we bought that business um i had investors that, uh, in that and we bought that business two years ago three years ago so we have the collect now is there's two separate businesses there's the big bin waste drop off which is the petrol forecourt so we're, we're going to scale in that throughout ireland at the moment uh so we hope to have those on, on petrol forecourts in every town and uh town in ireland um, so there's that business, which is like, uh, it's called bigbin.ie. And then we have collect, which is the online part of the business. So there's two, you got the waste drop off and you got the online part. Okay, cool. And the online part would be if people are kind of just booking in to get stuff taken from their house or. Yeah. Like, so it's, well, it's, nice. it's anything. Sorry, go on. No, like, that's more, is it like the, the more service end of things where you guys are actually going to go collect that stuff from them? Or is that the, how's that, that business work? Yeah, so uh, collect.ie is um, 
whatever you need to get rid of. So, so household owners like have different ways to need. Some will want to get their bins collected. Some will have uh, an armchair they need collected. Some people need a garden chaise. Some people need a skip. So what we say about collectors, we collect everything waste. So no matter what your waste is, uh, you come onto our platform and we'll give you a price. And if you want to go ahead, we'll outsource it to a third party collector. So we work with like skip companies, junk companies, bin companies. Um, yeah, so whatever your waste need is, we're just trying to make it. Uh, we're just trying to make it simple that people don't. Need, there's no damage. So what, what what's really interesting to me about this business as well is that you guys are like you said you started five years ago, right? Usually businesses mm-hmm. take a good few years to get established and then they look for outside capital or whatever. And I saw that on the website you guys are getting raising capital in Sweden. How the hell does that come along for uh, a waste company in Ireland? How, how does that work? I never heard of that before. Yeah, so we would have um, we would have bootstrapped the business for the first three years, um, <clears throat> and we would have grown to about two point five million revenue in year three. And um, you know, we took us we got a small amount of investment of a uh, hundred thousand. So yeah, really, we just uh, bootstrapped for the first few years, and then we went. I suppose like I've been in lots of businesses, and so have my co-founders. And you know, when you get the product market fits right, um, we really got that in year three. We're like, okay, we're really on something here. We're acquiring customers really cheaply, cheaply, lifetime values goes. Um, you know, obviously people are navigating online. Um, obviously they're doing, people are looking to book waste services online because they're doing it in every other industry, like foods, transport. Um, so it's like, okay, let's get some investment. And um, as I spoke about earlier, I would have got investment in the past by, um you know, in the different companies I've been involved in. And uh, yeah, we're just looking around. We're really sort of like, we spent a while looking at the different options. And like, it's not, it's not easy. I don't, my experience is it's never easy. <laughs> I have to be honest, like, I don't know if I'm doing something wrong, but um, it's, 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 we went around and we spoke to, you know, the, um, we spoke to the VCs, we would have spoke to privates, we would have spoke to, um, you know, different um, families and, um you know, I went to Sweden. There was a, an Irish company after it had been listed over in Sweden. So I would have gone over to Sweden with um, with the NASDAQ people and with some Irish companies. I think about eight Irish companies went over and we looked at the landscape over there. Got to meet some Swedish people. You know, it's very techy over there. There's good uh, ecosystem over there. Like what happens in Sweden is, um, you know, the way that we, first of all, most people in Sweden trade shares their pensions, like me or you would be talking, instead of talking about soccer, we'd be talking about shares. People trade shares because their pensions are tied into it and they do it when they're young and it's just the thing to do. Like, uh, I think 80% of people trade shares uh, over there. So it's, it's a very common thing to do. So like what a lot, the ecosystem over there is like, like what a lot of startups do over there is they list to raise money. And investors like that because they can trade the shares easily. So if you can imagine, say, if the same ecosystem was here in Ireland, like, uh, you know your friend's startups trying to raise money and you can buy shares in this or your or a company that you use and you can buy shares in it and you can trade them tomorrow if you want so you can see the logic of why it's a really uh, good way over there to do it so I would have gone over there um, I would have spoke to lots of different waste companies lots of different VCs uh, would have spoke to um, you know some banks and uh, also to the Irish company that listed over there the one Irish company had listed there and at that stage they had a really good experience over there um so that would have planted the seeds in our head that maybe this is something we could do and um we'd have waited another few months and then we went you know we'd a couple of we'd nothing concrete in the table we'd maybe a couple of offers um and we went back to sweden again and they're very focused on the waste over there and on you know zero sustainability and zero um carbon and uh no landfill and all that and i liked i got speaking to some waste guys there and between everything uh the the opportunity came to list there so um you know one of the banks said look you could list over here and you know you've met some of the investors people that invest in these type of companies and they understand what you're doing and um yeah so we just said pretty much it's it's a process then as you do um you do an information memorandum and you shop it around to the different banks there and then you get someone to look after the listing for you. You know, once you choose who'd probably be best to list the company with. And we went through that process and um, you know, last uh, December 2019, then we would have listed there and raised, um, we raised uh, just over a million, um, just over 1.5 million, sorry. 1.7 million um, on the, uh, on the NASDAQ first North, which is a, uh, it's a, it's a, it's a 
it's a stock exchange for startups, for high growth startups. So, uh, you know, perfect place for us. Such an interesting thing. Like it's a real thinking outside the box, which we love here. But also I, I, I worked for a couple of years for HubSpot in the Nordics. Um, so I completely get what you mean when you're talking about the, them being very tech savvy and very uh, also into investing and stuff like that because their government allows them to invest really early with yeah. really very flexible ways of doing it. It's not a big deal. You know, sometimes in Ireland, it's a big deal to set up like a director's pension. Me and Mark have talked about this before. We've had people on the on the podcast given a, given a pension advice and stuff like that. And we've got stuff in Ireland like deemed disposal on uh, ETFs. So like every eight years, the government sa- here says that you've so- it's like you've sold those ETFs and you have to pay tax on the gains. And it, over, you know, t- a 30-year career, that cuts your wealth so by so much you know um but the the guys in the Nordics really have it sorted out like it's like the, it's like the, their their plan is to make everyone well off in the Nordics. that's the or yeah like, or at least give everyone a seat at the table whether it is just investing in uh you know small cap uh companies or i don't know it just it seems it's a great place mark i think you, you've never even been to the Nordics, mark have you no no you're always selling it to me so maybe you'll take a trip and we're allowed to leave the country yeah. <laughs> it's great it's actually a lovely spot it's like they, and, and they're very um they're yeah they're very um up to speed with what's going on in in tech and regards like and and, and also like they're they've they're very uh, on the ball with business like every one of them are really included maybe that's the circles that i know over there but they um but they really know uh you know all the different uh companies are out there and all the, you know what's doing well and what tech stack to even build on or who to speak to regards this problem uh we found them great because i <clears throat> i used to sell to them uh, kind of directly and they it was you know, like like i said that if, if you can put to if you can just fix the problem that they ask for they'll just buy it's not it's not really an emotional thing it's not like i, I mean i've sold sold in uh not not picking on the english but sometimes if you're you can get a, <laughs> like it's like it's a game doing a negotiation with them it's like it has yeah, nothing yeah. to do with the product anymore. <laughs> what are we doing? Are we just going to hurt my feelings? I don't understand. Sure. That's the whole thing. <laughs> I'm like, what's it to you? Anyway, uh, right. So when you go, you've, you've raised money in uh, in Sweden. Is the, like when you guys are from a regulatory point of view, I know you mentioned that it's uh, for the, the kind of more startups scene or the gro- kind of high growth companies. Uh, is the regulation and stuff like that, does that take a lot of time out of your day to kind of keep up to date with like publishing figures and stuff like that is does that hinder you guys yeah, it does it does yeah 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 it does it, it's it's uh, in a way uh so be, be getting list this is we've probably done it the, the obviously different than most companies and um just gotta see how that works out but anyway getting listed um first of all we the first thing that needs to happen is we need to have a board because um you know the board was me john and robbie the three founders so it made us grow up quicker which has only been a good thing. Like we got really good. So picking out our board was we have people on our boards that have grown, have been part of companies that have grown quickly and have been around publicly listed companies with good governance. So Johnny, our chairman, um, you know, he would have been on, uh, he would have been on, uh, he would have IPO the company, the first Irish company to IPO in the New York Stock Exchange, uh, Skillsoft, and he would have been um, CFO at, at the time. So, you know, he'd been around uh, publicly listed companies before, same with Malisha Okulakon, who's our, um, he's also on our board, and he would have been involved in three companies that list us. Um, and, and also they'd been involved in companies that had scaled quickly, you know, with the money that they'd raised. So um, for us, like, it was, it was, um, it was really good in that way. Um, we probably we were told beforehand what's involved, um, but like everything, you you naively think, ah, yeah, boss. It's it is a lot of work, but honestly, like we say it the whole time, it's made us a better company, and we were more structured. Like we're gone from startup to mature, so we st- we still feel like we're, we've um, you know, we've uh, we've grown it. We've a c- annual uh, growth rate from the second year of sixty percent um, each year. You know, that's that's where, that's where we're grown. Um, and you know it's you know straight away you get a board and you come up with a strategy a three-year plan and you know you get an org chart and you get reporting structures and you have a financial department and you have you know all these support and departments and you just yeah it was it was good for us my experience so far has been good um the bit about governance and you know um how i speak about stuff and 
you know, you do a lot of reports, you can't talk about things that are going to happen in the future. And, you know, everything, everything has to be, you know, anything good and bad is put out into the public. So anything, anything that happens in the company that could have an impact on investors or any share price or anything, you just put it out there and say the good and bad. So it's, yeah, it's, it's different because I think most startups are just, um, you know, a lot goes on and it's like, you don't have that, you don't feel that sense of responsibility maybe at the start. Really? I love that idea of growing up as quickly as possible. Like how many companies are three friends that are doing that for maybe five or six years, 10 years, and they never really put a board together, um, you know, and they could have got going as quickly as possible. Um, like it, um, uh, one of my friends is starting a, a business uh, and he's got investors and stuff like that right now. Um, and their, their exit strategy is between three and five years. And I think, I think that's really interesting. It's like, we're going to sell it. That's how, like, it's a real kind of go, go, go. Um, yeah. so they're starting off kind of with the board and everything because they're getting that investment. As early as wow. Possible. That's so, really, look, they've probably got the experience around them. They've obviously got a board that's done this before. That's a really clever way of doing this. Yeah. yeah. And so, John, you're co-founders. Um, like, how would you describe what, what you all kind of bring to the table? Do you all, are you all very different? You know? Yeah, we will be different. So, um, yeah, we've all got different skills and the, the first of the culture came obviously from all three of us. So we would have been, we would have been a year in the company before we actually wrote down what our, what our vision is as such and what our core values are. Cause like we had to mesh together the three of us and really work. You know, sometimes you, you now I've been involved in startups where I've done this is like, I put, I put my core, sorry, now one sec, I put my core values up straight away or, you know, I say this is what the company's about, but we waited a year to see how we all blended together and what's important to the three of us. And, and, you know, the, the, one of the major things like that we, we try to make it simple for people to book away service online and to wow people with customer service. So customer service is a thing that joins me, John and Robbie together. We really genuinely care about our customers and we uh, feel like, you know, even though we do like, I don't know, 10, 20,000 jobs a month, like we look at it, we know when everything bad happens, but at the start, I suppose in the first year together, like if a bin was missed by one of our collectors, like, John would go down in his car and put it in his booth and like get the rubbish to wherever it needed to get to. Not because, not because like I was telling him it's because he wants it and he didn't want to leave down a customer. And I, and that might sound extreme, but like, like if you care that much about not leaving people down and then the three of us get that down as our, as our core values and our culture, um, you know, then the next people that come in really buy into that. So like the three of us have different skills. We're all together with regards um great great customer service but Robbie would be then more on the tech side so he's very strong on tech and he's very strong on processes um John John Hagerty the other co-founder operations so he'd be very good at the culture like making sure everyone's aligned and has the same vision and implementing uh that sort of like he's a real casual guy and really a decent sound guy doesn't get stressed and he he's able to get that across to you know the people that have come in since and then I'd set the pace I'd probably be um big picture stuff and you know, the entre- more on more on entre- the lads are entrepreneurial, but more so I'd um and I'd be setting the pace mainly. That's my I think that's my role is like sort of like okay, let, here's the plan, let's go and you know I'd I'd be um I'd have I'd have uh, say eight people report and intubate and I try and help them as much as I can like hit their targets. It's a really good mix though, isn't it? You know, for for you all to be have those different aspects. It's very it's quite difficult if you were on your own to actually have all those different aspects in the one person. There are some of them are almost counteracting the others, you know. Um, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Organiz- yeah. Try, trying to put organization on a <laughs> on an on a, a born entrepreneur is tough. It's tough work. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I think it's like look, uh, I've in life, man. You need even like regard the boards. It's like you just need to surround yourself with people that are th- different skill sets, like. Um, and that you know the guys we're we're you, you go through your things like i think having co-founders it's tough like it's like a marriage isn't it Jeez, it's like we've had our ups and downs but uh we're pretty we're pretty honest with one we got the place now where we can we can be pretty honest with one another and you know um and we're we're tight enough and the we're tight enough where we want to go to but it is it's 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 i feel lucky sometimes to have the two guys and one thing i noticed on it was on your your linkedin actually was the Subway franchise. I think everybody yeah. at, at some stage have. think thinks about that, you know, or a, or a McDonald's or maybe I that's thought, too big. Remember, Mark, when I was at, I was, I was probably 14 or 15. Or yeah. Something, and I was thinking that I loved Subway. I was, I was born in Canada. I grew up on Subway. 
And uh, and then I was thinking that when they first got here, I'm like, that's going to be a gold mine. But what was the how, how was that experience being a franchisee? Is that a, do you think that's a good way for people to get their feet wet uh, in entrepreneurship if they didn't have a great idea? What's your your thoughts there? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What you were saying there is, I think, did you think of having, which one did you think of having more so? Was it Subway or McDonald's? We actually, originally we we, uh, we, we were thinking about McDonald's because I've got an uncle uh, who's like, he's working at McDonald's 20 years or 30 years, something like that. Um, but the cost, I think, is it's like the minimum at the time, it was like 900 grand or something. And uh, I was working yeah. in the city at the time. Uh, in the warehouse, and it was the same beyond me. I don't know, Mark, you remembering those days? <laughs> it can't, can't possibly be that much, was it? I thought it was like a hundred grand or something. I have no idea. No, you need a million of of um, liquid assets, um, but that's what I remember because I was the same. I was I wanted a McDonald's. I didn't want it. Listen, Subway's a great brand. I'll tell you about that now. But I wanted the McDonald's, uh, and really, I suppose if you look back on it, a million euros for McDonald's is probably worth it if you could get your hands on it because it's a great brand and. Um, like the McDonald's, there's two here in Waterford where I'm living now and they do great business uh, and they're all, they're very innovative McDonald's. But anyway, Subway, I had 15,000. So it was Subway it was. And um, I got, no, 10,000 it was for the Subway franchise. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it was good. Uh, Subway were great. I went to Subway University over in America. So like I was only, I was still, I was in college. I was in college. I think I was still in college and you'd go over to, um, you'd go over to Subway University over in New York um so I bought the franchise went over did six weeks or four weeks over there um really good really good um really good training um you know really good uh product obviously and it was just coming into ireland as well so around that time i think the first one opened maybe 10 years before but there wasn't that many subways in ireland so it was pretty at the time like people were really interested in the subway and the brands and a good few opened at the same time and um it was a crazy time. I remember looking around for locations and this was during the boom, 2002, you know, three, four, and looking for the right town to put it in. And at that time, you probably remember as well, it was all upwards only rents. Like if you wanted a good location on a, a shop, in, name any shop, because I went to nearly every street around Ireland, you know, any of the shopping streets in Tralee or Carlo, like you're paying 100 grand key money just to get the premises and then you have to fit it out and then you're paying upwards only rents. And uh, oh, I was crazy times, but anyway, I got a, I got a, I got a, I got a store, and I got started, and you know, it was really good time. It was I learned a lot. You learn because like they've done it all before again. Like they're giving you a booklet, and they're giving you they have secret shoppers coming in to try and help you, and they're giving you the benefit of their experience, and you just, just got to listen to them. Like um, they told me one thing really interesting. Now this might be exactly right, but if you put an extra tomato on every roll, it was going to cost you thirty grand a year. So if your staff did something like, you know, if they put an extra, like everything is portion control. Most, most, that's probably an exaggeration, but most of your losses in food are true. Like, obviously I know that now are true. Not being, not having the rice, you know, keeping, you know, overcooking stuff and throwing out waste of food. So they're very good at portion control and, you know, telling you your metrics and your KPIs to run a good shop. And where, where did you, did you put one in, in the end into, into, did you go all the way or? Oh yeah, sorry, I did. Sorry, guys. Yeah, I opened one up in Carlo, and I was okay. an investor in another one. And um, yeah, it was it was really good. It was really good. I was beside. I I think I was the latest opening. We used, there was a nightclub at either side of me, so I started opening late. Nice. <laughs> so it was really busy. Like you know, all the nightclub or lads coming out of nightclubs. Um, yeah. And it's funny, they'd be really nice during the day. You'd have these guys that are like really nice during the day. They'd be like, hey, John, and they're all really nice. And then they come in and they're drunk. <laughs> they'd be throwing money at you. You know, it's during the boom, like, <laughs> there's 20 euros. <laughs> I'd be like, thank you. <laughs> Here's your meatball, Mar- Marinara. Mar- yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's funny about the McDonald's thing because like, in Do- me and Mark are from Dunleary. Well, we grew up in Dunleary um, uh, here in Dublin. And, the you know Dunleary kind of died a death or after two thousand and eight anyway everything's kind of shut up shop there was no real retail or anything like that um, but the only thing that was always there's always a queue is uh, McDonald's that's going nowhere did you ever notice that Mark because there's always yeah. people there like um, yeah so we just need to get a, a million together and uh, <laughs> get the like, you know the hairnet is there any locations left though I don't know if there's any places you could put one now they I seem think, to all be it, it depends on what so I think. Do you know what I think? If someone had a million, um, maybe something like, 
uh, somewhere in North Wicklow beyond Bray. So maybe like uh, mm. and Kennedy or something. There's loads of families around there. Like yeah, yeah. Uh, building 30,000 houses around here. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe something, and you might get a good deal on rent and that's, I don't know. You, well, you've done uh, a few, uh, you've been in a few climber. businesses, John, that would you like, would you recommend, you know, the kind of food industry, have your experience to, to people to, to look at it or just stare away from or? Oh, I think there's really, it's such hard work. Hmm. Like I'm hats off to anyone that's in this. It's you're, you're up against sharp people. There's always new people coming into the industry. They're always hungrier. Um, you know, it's, there's some people do really well. I look, my experience of it was I got a franchise, so I wasn't at that side of it, but I, I have friends that are involved. My, actually, my brother has pubs and restaurants in London. So, um, you know, I do understand it from what he says. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a tough industry. I know people who've come out of it and they're really dynamic and have excelled mm-hmm. then in other industries, like, cause you know, and they, they can't, and you know, it's like working in weekends and like evenings, geez, yeah. so hard. <laughs> So tough. And then the, with with the pandemic thrown in on top of that was was, was tough. That's how, how, has, how has Collect been affected by the pandemic, if if at all? Um, yeah, so like we, it was scary. I, I was sharing this. I, it was scary right at the beginning. Like you know, like everyone, it was like we didn't know what was. Um, you know, we didn't know what impact it would have because I think when they announced the lockdown, it was like we weren't even sure if we could operate. Um, but as time went on and people were booking their clothes online and they're booking, you know, everything else online, obviously waste became people start doing clear outs there at home and they were looking to get rid of stuff from their attic and painting the house and the garage clear outs. And um, I think our message, like we're still we still haven't done national advertising in Ireland yet. We're probably a year off from doing that. But I think our brand where we were known that people knew, all right, I've got this thing out in the garage I need to get rid of. I go on to collect. And like, I just think that message started resonating with people, especially in the areas where we're strong, the cities where we're strong. And yeah, we, we like, as I spoke about earlier, we grew 60% um, year and year um, last year compared to 2019. Um, and that was mainly through people booking online and also uh, doing house clear outs and everything. Um, so we missed what, what did happen with us is we have a big commercial size of our, our business. So we have a lot of, we do, um, we do, uh, skip comp. We, we'd be, uh, say like JJ Rattigan, and the builders, we'd have contracts with big builders where they can go to us for all their skips. So we missed all that business, but we're able to grow the domestic side of our business. So, um, look, we're, we're lucky that we're in an industry that's resilient. Yeah. And where, where's your kind of growth plans at the moment geographically? Is it, have you, a lot more to do in Ireland or are you looking at the UK and Europe and yeah so we're just like as I said there like we're we're just getting going um we feel like we're we feel around the growth stage now but like not many people have heard of collecting Ireland so really we have a big job to build that brand so uh I hope in the you know in the next year now to um build that brand that we become known nationally and we're we're also in Manchester at the moment as well so we're our our growth strategy in the UK is city by city so we we'll get Manchester right, and then we we'll go to the next city, next city. Um, so yeah, we're pretty ambitious, and, and we're, you know, the pandemic. We we came up with a strategy, but our strategy changed. So now we're down. We're right now. We're putting our strategy together for the next three years because the pandemic's over now. You can plan better. Um, so yeah, that's that that that's uh, that's our plan now as the UK and keep growing market share here in Ireland. Populations are are just completely different though aren't they like it's just the next level like you say Manchester yeah, I don't know how how would you compare Manchester to Dublin even I don't know how, how many times is the size it would be um yeah is, yeah greater is Manchester's it, three and a half million is it yeah wow well, sorry Reading Birmingham as well is huge isn't it yeah it's yeah. also like, do you remember, like we forget how small Ireland is and we think they were so important and I was watching something the other day and they were saying you know Nigeria has 200 million people in it I'm like what how are they even can't really move, <laughs> move, you know, in Ireland is no like somebody yeah. here, but um, yeah, we punch above our weight though, I think, which is good. Um, so John, thanks very much for joining us. We do have one kind of part left, uh, for the shark pot. I know uh, we'll, we'll let you we'll let you go then. It is it is the lightning round, all right. So these are lightning questions that we ask CEOs, business leaders, artists, some people that climb mountains, <laughs> whatever, whatever, whoever we have. In <laughs> And uh, and Mark Mark kind of rattles these off. They don't have to be real quick answers, but uh, just interesting to pick your brain on some stuff. Yep. So, what apps? Okay. What apps on your phone do you use the most? 
Coinbase. Coinbase. <laughs> Dig into that now. It's been a, been a tough L, tough L month on the on the boards there. What, what, <laughs> what's uh, what's what's your hot take? Uh, where, where are you going all in on? I'm actually just. I'm really interested in this. So money, like, I'm, it's an obsession at the moment. So I'm just educating myself. But I don't. I don't like. Look, I don't know enough about it. But I definitely am a Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin is the only one I could. I could talk about. Okay. So I the crypto thing is very interesting space. Like, there's so much. There's so much involved. There's so many different. Eight thousand different coins out there. Crazy. Oh, it's. Uh, my, I, I watch this guy, and I don't know if he's actually from Ireland or not, because he's got kind of an Irish twang. He's on YouTube. He's one of the big. Bitcoin guys start to follow. Him. He he's, he seems to be based in America, but he sounds like a he's got a kind of a weird Dublin accent. I don't know if he spent some time here or something. We'll get him on the but, podcast. God, we can yeah. advice. <laughs> yeah, I, I took his advice advice the other day. It did not go well. So maybe get him on. <laughs> I see they're all gone missing today. I, I was on I was on Clubhouse. There's a room in Clubhouse where they'd all be. You know, all, all, real Jimmy Song. All these guys who were who were real thought leaders in the space. And today I went in there to the different rooms. They're all gone. <laughs> I say they're just like it was like you know 50, 60 percent drops over the weekend. So it's uh, been a tough weekend for them. The how, is- how do you find? Sorry, Luke. How do you find Clubhouse, John? We haven't we haven't even looked at that, Luke, have we? Not really. Brilliant. Oh yeah. my God, it's all living us. Like it's absolutely because what you're getting right now, I think it's right at the start. So like I'm into marketplaces and platforms and different marketing strategies. So you get you, some you get real tall leaders in there and. Uh, you mean the audience and you can go up and ask them questions but like it depends on the topic so like i go into clubhouse usually late at night and i'll see something that might interest me so like they'll have a topic like um um you know are stripe better than this company say stripe better than paypal regarding fees and you just jump in and you can just listen to different people in real time giving their opinions and their experience and you can jump up and ask questions um and that's the same with crypto and like whatever you're into it's look like from therapy to business to crypto, there's loads of different rooms, um, but it's it's really good. It's really social. We got to get in that market. I think it's perfect for, for crypto. I feel like everyone wants to get it because it's it's such it's the wild west and a lot of, and in a good way, kind of a gold rush type feel to it. Um, and I just feel yeah. like the other day I was at a I was at a, 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 a well, actually I wasn't at a party, but if I was at a party. <laughs> 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 Uh, depending on when you're listening to this um, I heard somebody at a party was saying that uh, like uh, uh, everyone there was talking about these different coins and all that they invested in and these are people that are not really into you know they wouldn't be into investing generally but they're they're putting a lot of money across these ones I've never heard of and I just thought to myself this 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 feels a bit it feels a bit kind of uh, you know gold rushy but I love it I think it's good I think people if it gets people into investing and spending their money on something else other than just like random stuff you know um but i think you know it's the the thing in <clears throat> i used to work in davy stockbrokers after college and there was this uh the thing you sell say is uh, sell in may and go away so like if you look at every at every year usually the best growth happens in january when everyone gets back to work and then it goes up 10 percent or something by may and then if you just sold every may and come back at the end of the year uh when there's a big sell-off and buy in then you'd be all right Do you know wow so, Listen, every, don't don't take that financial advice necessarily. That is not financial advice. Well, my career went nowhere in finance, so you should uh, take that opinion. I was in value. I was at uh, valuations as well, so uh, they didn't respect my opinion. But, uh, okay, right. Next, next question. And I don't, I don't ask everybody this, but I think I really want to ask you, John. What's the best business idea you've never acted upon? If you want to give it away. <laughs> oh. Yeah, look, um, Jesus, that's a tough one. Like, because sometimes I uh, let me think here now. Um, sorry, guys, nothing's coming to me. It mustn't be that good. I can't think of anything. Like, I, I usually inst- I act out, but like I have come across businesses. Like, there was software there for apartment complexes. I think it's a company over in America. Um, just because like, I, I, I've been in apartment complexes, and I know how hard it is to communicate with the tenants, and they came up with software. SAS that all the te- you know all the tenants can talk the landlord can talk to the tenants and I just thought that was pretty good and I think it's scalable because there's thousands of apartment blocks in every country throughout the world and it's hard to communicate with your tenants through one communication tool so it'd be like you know WhatsApp for tenants but there's a company in America doing it but I'd have been talking with that for ages um so yeah maybe that's um so I'm, pr- I'm pretty happy with being in the waste <laughs> it, it seems <laughs> so like you 
you, you made an effort to, to try a lot of businesses anyway. So you probably, yeah, probably yeah. tried most of them. Um, <laughs> well, okay. How much money is enough money? Um, oh, I don't know if I'm driven by money. I'm not anymore. Like I'm pretty comfortable. My, my wife's got, you know, and that's not being like, we're not by any means are really rich or anything like that, but we're, we have a comfortable life. And um, I'd rather build good, Good, good company and I'm sure by product as you make money but I'm not really don't have an extravagant lifestyle or anything like that at all so um, but I, I'd like I'd like some you know I'd like a certain amount but I'm not that bothered it'll, it'll happen um, and I'm happy where I'm at it's such an interesting thing when you ask people that some people have the the number picked out in their head um, some people are just say someone uh, someone was thinking real is like just 70 grand just like could take probably two years off go travel the world I'm like yeah but you have to yeah you know, <laughs> you know whatever but uh i think uh someone i was talking to somebody uh you know a guy who's sold a few companies now and he's a bit older you know he's in his kind of maybe 60s so yeah up that end of the thing and he said it's it's better to have fun in your kind of 20s and 30s building businesses uh because you don't really need that much like to get by and everyone else is just saving for retirement anyway uh and yeah. that's when you've had all that kind of interesting experience in your forties, you'll start to be asked to be on boards and stuff. And you get like, <laughs> you just like, that would be your retirement fund. Yeah. After, <laughs> you know? So I, uh, yeah. I kind of liked his take on it. I never really thought about it like that. And I thought, uh, cause I know being on boards, so some people are on loads of boards, you know? Uh, yeah. 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 You know? That'd be my absolute nightmare. <laughs> really to be on a board like yeah gee, uh, but see, everyone's different, isn't it? Like, I, yeah. like I know the reason money, I, I don't think money's, uh, because like I know lots of people with lots of money and they're miserable. Like I'd rather uh, have, you know, I'd rather be like building a good company and doing what the other stuff I'm interested in and having a bit of fun along the way. And yeah, like and not be on boards, loads of boards. <laughs> I'd love to advise startups though. I'd love to be just an advisor, try and be like like I'm sure you come across like you you meet loads of entrepreneurs and it's it's re- that's really exciting just having chats and stuff. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, is it who you know or what you know? Oh, I think not. <laughs> Sorry, I lost you there, lads. Apologies. Lost, yeah. We thought you were just being really pensive thinking about yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, my phone was ringing. Uh, no, did I answer this? No. Did you hear me? No, I didn't okay. hear you. Sorry. I think I, who, who you know? Yeah, I think it's who you know. I like that. Okay, I'll, I'll ask that one again for the recording, right? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Is it who you know or what you know? I think it's a bit of both. <laughs> so it's, I changed my mind. It's, um, yeah, it's like definitely as I've gone on, a, on business, it's uh, who I know because, and who I know are people who've done what I've done before and they give me good pointers. Like I know what I know through my experience and then there's loads I haven't done yet. So at different stages in our company, it's who you know. And then like what I know is then like, what I, what I know is like the experience is like all the mistakes I've made up to now. And that's like, you know, all the mistakes I've made like last week, uh, you know, regard managing people and, you know, all that sort of stuff. So a bit of both. Unbelievable. And I think who you know is important as well, Mark, because remember during the week, uh, an accountant uh, gave me some advice that uh, saved me a few bob as well. Remember, I was about to pull the trigger on something. He's like, stop, stop, go back, go back. So, yeah. uh, so I was on the edge, John. I was about to pull the trigger on something. He said, don't get away, walk away from that. Anyway, so shout out to Alan. Um, so anyway, what, what we'll uh, we'll do is we just we just our last uh, question is usually our, like, what would you prefer? Would you prefer a shark pod T-shirt that looks something like this, or would you prefer a mug? The mugs are pretty high quality as well. Mark's got one there. Yeah, I take the mug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent. The mug is on mug. the way. Listen, John, thanks very much for spending some time with us this evening. And, uh, you know, we thought it's such an interesting story, interesting way of uh, approaching uh, a really old problem with a new lens. Love that. So we can't, we, you know, can't wish you more uh, luck in the future. And thanks very much for joining the Shark Pod this evening. Thanks, Emil, John. Thanks, lads. Cheers. Um, that was really good. Thanks for that, lads. Really interesting.